everybody, thanks for joining me here today. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about modern observability and software development. Uh, my name is Josh Hendrick. I am a senior solution engineer with Rookout. Um, I've been in the industry for a number of years and held a number of different positions uh, from software development through DevOps, professional services, and solution architecture. So I have a broad range of, of experience uh, across the industry. Um, what we're going to talk a little bit about today is really starting from the beginning, you know, where do we come from? Where are we today in terms of the evolution of software development? And, and why do we need uh, these monitoring and observability cap capabilities that we have today? Um, what is the real need for observability? Um, what are some organizations doing in terms of uh, constructing their observability pipelines uh, so that they have all of the information they need, where they need it and where it should go? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about dynamic observability, um, which is really kind of taking observability to the next level. Um, and specifically, we'll, we'll talk uh, a little bit about a tool that helps you um, decouple uh, data access from code so that you can access and get better insight into uh, your code while it's running in development, testing, or production environments. And at the end, we'll do a very short uh, five-minute demo just to kind of show you how that all works. So without further ado, I'll, I'll jump right into it. Um, looking uh, back where we've come from, right? We, we really started uh, developing what we now call monolithic applications, which uh, were historically composed of these big bang releases, right? Where you have these tightly coupled applications, organizations would release software every six months, every quarter, every year sometimes. Um, and we found that that wasn't good enough to go as fast as we need to be going. Um, there was a, a shift towards service-oriented architectures, probably you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was kind of the, the, the buzzword, uh, where we started to decouple these services that we were building into more of these coarsely grained services. And that shifted us to where we are today. A lot of the organizations that, that I talk to are shifting or have shifted to microservices-based applications, which um, really have a goal of being uh, highly maintainable, um, agile development teams can build individual services. They're interdependently deployable, so you don't have to take the whole system down if you want to upgrade a specific component of your of your system. Um, and and so things have changed, right, over over the years with software development. There's been a major shift organizations are taking from developing um, on-prem to the public cloud. Uh, organizations, it's now normal to develop these hybrid uh, architectures where you have some components on-prem, some components in the, in the cloud. Uh, there's been a big shift from uh, virtual machines or, or these static servers to containers um, and uh, a shift towards these container orchestration platforms like Kubernetes, for example. Um, so Kubernetes has really become the, the standard for container orchestration. There's a number of other platforms out there, but most of the folks that I talk to um, are, are migrating or, or have migrated a number of their workloads into Kubernetes. Um, and so this, this shift from monolith to microservices has enabled development teams to undertake uh, hypothesis-driven development, if you will, where we have these small iterations, teams can experiment a little bit more easily, get fast feedback on a new feature that they're introducing. If it doesn't work, quickly pivot and shift into something new. Um, and it just makes life a lot easier um, on, on development teams. And so with all of these architectural changes, we need uh, new ways to observe uh, the software as it's running in, uh, in kind of this, this new world, if you will. Um, so that kind of brings us into looking at monitoring and observability, right? So I think it's kind of important to start distinguishing between monitoring and observability. Monitoring, if you kind of look back at it, it it's really something that helps determine the state of an application. Um, and, and really, the way I look at monitoring is, is it's typically been kind of a set of predefined metrics that allow you to identify uh, application or infrastructure issues, give alerts on predefined things that you want to know about while your application is running, right? So it's kind of an actual task of collecting some of these uh, pieces of data, maybe displaying them in a dashboard and things of that nature. Um, whereas observability, uh, if you look at the definition of it, right, it's, it's really a measure of how well uh, the internal states of an application can be inferred based on external outputs. Um, the way it really works is by combining metrics, logs, and traces to instrument applications. A lot of times it requires writing more code. Um, you, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways that you can integrate uh, new logging frameworks or tracing frameworks, which we'll talk a little bit about in, in, in just a moment. But uh, 
over uh, and above all, they're really in the symbiotic relationship, um, observability kind of taking things to the next level. Uh, and, and, and why the need for observability, right? We really have this need for fast feedback nowadays. Teams want to be able to be alerted immediately if something goes wrong. So you need this fast feedback about the state of your application really on demand whenever, whenever you want it, uh, right? So since applications are in this major paradigm shift, uh, move to containers, uh, orchestration platforms, microservices, service meshes, serverless applications, all of these distributed components um, are, are, are now ephemeral, a little bit more complex, right? With the, the scalability and um, the ability to pivot more easily, uh, there is more complexity to deal with, more places where failure can occur. And having a, a very easily uh, debuggable application, if you will, is definitely a, a key point when you're, when you're building a, a robust system, right? So the goal is to be able to deliver fast feedback about the state of your application really anytime on demand, whenever you, whenever you need it. Um, one, one kind of architecture for, for building uh, observability uh, is, is kind of this observability pipeline, if you will. I, I, I kind of bring it up just to, uh, to show what, what some organizations are doing as they become more and more advanced in the observability space. You don't necessarily need to go through all of this from the very beginning, uh, but it's interesting to kind of take, take a look at, right? So, Developers are building these microservices, containers, sometimes VMs um, that are producing logs from your application, metrics, traces, um, and they need some place to put those things, right? So um, what, rather than having each developer have to uh, create custom code for uh, writing all of this and sending it somewhere, uh, a lot of times what they'll, what organizations will do is create this kind of uh, routing mechanism or single component that handles uh, and, and feeds or, or, or takes as um, input, you know, these logs and metrics and traces and properly routes those to the, to the right destinations, delivers alerts, um, takes the data and normalizes it into a specific schema. Um, and it's really kind of the central processing unit that takes the data, sends it to your logging tools your tracing tools, your monitoring tools or event management tools. Um, and, and kind of it has this nice flow of data uh, from the services where the data is produced all the way to the components where they're consumed and viewable uh, by, by developers, right? So I think as you build out your monitoring capabilities, um, a lot of organizations move towards uh, architectures such as, such as this. Um, so kind of shifting gears just a little bit and taking a look at some of the standards uh, around observability, I think it's kind of interesting, right? So uh, open tracing got a lot of uh, momentum, came out around 2016. Uh, it was broadly adopted by a lot of organizations that wanted, wanted a standard way of doing uh, tracing within their applications. Um, Open Census came out as well in 2018. And, and finally, in 2019, uh, Open Telemetry came about, right, which, which actually tied together Open Tracing, Open Census. Um, and Open Telemetry actually just released version uh, 1.0 uh, of their, their SDKs and their applications. So uh, congratulations to the Open Telemetry team. That's a great milestone. Um, and, and really the goal of this was to be able to play well with existing network topologies, not be vendor specific uh, so that you're tied into a specific vendor. A lot of times what you have is different teams within organizations using different tools, uh, different APM tools, different tracing tools, different you know, metrics collection tools, whether it's Prometheus or Zipkin or Jaeger or all of these different tools. Um, the goal is to kind of really make one um, set of SDKs and APIs that organizations can use across all of their applications. Um, and so those came about and, and really aimed to consolidate what was going on uh, across the industry, right? So why is all that important, right? When you need to investigate a bug, um, really what you need to be able to do is observe it, right? If you can't observe the bug, you can't go about fixing it. So all of, uh, obviously many bugs are inherently hard to reproduce. Uh, a lot of times we're we're trying to reproduce a bug for days, weeks. I've talked to organizations that haven't been able to reproduce a bug and fix it for years, uh, if you can if you can imagine. Um, so having deep observability into those environments is really is really key, right? And there's all of these different uh, components that can play a role uh, with uh, finding and getting to the bottom of these issues, right? The state of your application, uh, data within your environment is is obviously key other service dependencies uh, and configurations in your environment, uh, the traffic coming into your applications. And these can all have different effects when you're changing these things, different side effects. They can affect the av av availability of your application. 
Uh, the cost uh, to be able to go in and fix these, you need to analyze that. Is it going to affect your security or performance? Um, so all of these are, are key things to keep in mind as you're going about analyzing uh, some of these things. Um, and so having the ability to observe your application uh, and really uh, be able to ask uh, arbitrary questions of your application on demand as you need to is becoming increasingly important. You don't always know upfront exactly what you're going to need. Um, developers kind of get into this mode where they write a ton of logs within their applications, right? Be to be able to get information that they may or may not need. They don't always know what they're gonna need ahead of time. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring up this, uh, this category of dynamic observability tools that, that uh, I, I think is pretty important. Um, so being able to reproduce and uh, get to the bottom of issues in the environment where they occur is incredibly important, right? So you need to be able to get to the data that's flowing within your application um, really at, at, at the level of your code uh, anytime that you need it, right? So rather than having to log everything, uh, you can use these dynamic observability tools that you can augment uh, your existing logs with or your existing metrics and traces and uh, get to the bottom of data that you need um, as, you, as you need it. So uh, one uh, you know, look at, at the process that organizations take um, you know, is, is kind of interesting to see, right? So when organizations and developers are uh, needing to add uh, new log lines or new, uh, new information to their code to be able to access the information that they need to resolve a defect, um, they go through a, a uh, usually complex process, right? So what happens is they'll typically add some code, uh, some log lines, some, some tracing information, some metrics to their application. They'll typically need to run some test cases uh, oftentimes they'll 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 push that to a repository, maybe GitHub, Bitbucket, whatever it may be. They'll open a pull request. Uh, most organizations have CI and CD processes that execute. So you're waiting for your continuous integration process to run. Uh, you're getting approvals oftentimes uh, for that change to be pushed to your environment. You're waiting for that build to happen. You're deploying it. And then you're waiting for that new code change to to drop. And then you're trying to search for the data that you need. So rather than having to go through all of this all the time. Um, dynamic observability tools can come into play, which can basically bridge uh, that gap, right? And get you directly from uh, the point where you're needing to add all this information to your code right to the point where you can get that data on demand uh, as, you, as you need it. Um, so just a quick look, and this is gonna kind of lead into the, the, the quick demo that we're gonna do. Uh, just a quick look at how uh, it may be deployed into an environment that you have, kind of digging into the technical level now. So this is an example with Kubernetes. You may be deployed in a different type of environment, but you know, essentially a lot of these tools, uh, you know, from, from open tracing to these dynamic observability tools that we're talking about, a lot of times there's an SDK, um, sometimes an agent that you may install within uh, your application. Uh, in the case of Kubernetes, you can see here, uh, it could be within a pod uh, within your Kubernetes cluster. And they allow developers to remotely um, interact with the application, collect data on demand uh, from the environment and uh, really that happens by going in and setting data collection points within a running application to collect snapshots of data, um, things like local variable values, stack traces, profiling information, tracing information um, on demand whenever you need it, right? So it kind of relates back to this notion of being able to access any data that you need from your application on demand uh, whenever, whenever you need it. Um, and that's, that's becoming more and more important, right? So that kind of leads us into uh, the uh, the demo. So I kind of want to switch gears and switch over to uh, Rookout, our, our demo application, to show you a, uh, a very quick demo of how you can actually use this within your environment. So let's say I have, uh, just like my slide showed, let's say I have a uh, an application that's deployed in Kubernetes, and I want to be able to go in and ask some, some questions of that application, right? I want to be able to collect some data um, and understand what's happening while the application is running. That application may be running uh, in the development environment, may be running in a, a test or QA environment, and may be running in a production environment. And uh, what I want to be able to do is uh, start to debug those instances on demand uh, without having to make any, any code changes. So um, with Rookout, what I can do is I can go in and I can uh, immediately uh, tell it which instances in my environment, maybe microservices that I'd like to debug. Uh, in my case, I have a Java application that's running. It's actually running in Google Cloud. It's running within a Kubernetes cluster. 
Um, and it has the Rookout SDK uh, that's been configured and attached to it. So what I'm going to be able to do now is whenever a, a customer or myself go in and interact with the application, um, I'm going to be able to immediately get some feedback on what's happening within my code, within the application, uh, really on demand as I, as I need that. So I'm going to go in uh, to Rookout, and I'm going to select the instances I want to debug. Um, typically, that'll be based on a host name or a pod or an IP address um, or, or, or even a custom label that I can attach to my instance. Um, so I'm going to type in a, a label. I'm going to choose it. And you can see I have 13 instances where I've actually configured Rookout. And I want to come in, and I want to debug one of them. Right? Uh, this instance is my to-do application uh, that you can see uh, the host name, which is the Kubernetes pod name. Uh, the repository, the GitHub repository that's tied to it. So this is the instance I want to debug. And I can go ahead and actually click Next and uh, jump in and immediately be ready to uh, start debugging that application. So the first step is actually to connect in to my source code repository. right? And you may do that uh, by connecting in and authenticating to your GitHub or Bitbucket repository um, or even a locally cloned uh, file system repository that you have, um, or even better, we can actually automatically reach out and fetch the repository. Because as you can imagine, you may have different versions of code running in development and test and production. Um, and you can configure this to automatically go out and fetch the right version of code for the environment that you're running in. Once you've, you've done that, you have the ability to, just like an IDE within your local environment, um, open up source code files and start to debug them um, exactly while they're running really without stopping them, without having to redeploy them or, or change any code. Um, so the process of doing it uh, looks very similar to how you would debug an application within your local IDE. So I've opened up uh, one of my Java files that uh, actually has some business logic that gets executed whenever I add a to-do item uh, to my to-do list. Right. So I have a function here called add to-do. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and set a data collection point within this application. So you can do that simply by clicking on a line directly next uh, to the application. And so what, what I've done is set a, uh, what we call a non-breaking breakpoint uh, on line 45, uh, where uh, you, know, you can see I have a log line on line 37, but maybe I wanna collect some data from a part of the code where I don't have a log line. Um, and kind of like we talked about without having to go back and change things, I can immediately get some feedback uh, on, on line 45 or any other line within the code where I'd like to set a data collection point. So I can come back within my application, um, maybe add a uh, to-do task to my list, uh, and then immediately come back in uh, to Rookout and see that we actually collected some data. So uh, within uh, Rookout, I can click on that line, and we can see that we captured some interesting information. So we collected all of the local variables, all of their values, um, all of the attributes and different objects and, and their variables and values. And we can immediately see that information regardless of where it's running, even in, in production. Uh, so I can uh, kind of observe dynamically what's going on within that application on, on demand. You can even kind of dive deeper, uh, understand where it's running server and process information. So I can see the Kubernetes pod or IP address where, where that application is running. I can get some insight into a stack trace so I can actually see how we got to this line of code. Uh, and even have the ability to set uh, data collection points in other areas of the code uh, up the stack that may have been called through this uh, call chain. And then I can even kind of, as we talked about, pull in tracing information. Uh, in this case, it's from Jaeger. Um, as long as you're using open tracing or open telemetry or any tool that supports those, we can actually pull in information and you can uh, sync this with trace IDs and span IDs and understand where this transaction fits in the context of a larger trace or a larger span. I can also take all of this data. I can send it to any existing logging framework that I might be using. So whether you, you're storing data in Elasticsearch or Splunk or wherever you might be, uh, be sending that, you can send data there as well. So you're maintaining that data in uh, kind of a, a, a consolidated central place. Um, and then I can even come in and do a, a bunch more things, which we're not going to get into today. Let's say I wanted to set a condition where I'm only collecting data from specific users. Maybe I'm doing data redaction for PII or sensitive data within my code. Um, there's a ton more that you can do. This is really just a taste of uh, some of the capabilities of a dynamic observability tool as it's running uh, within a production environment. Uh, but that kind of gives you gives you a little hint of uh, how things are working, um, and uh, you know some of the importance of of really having a deep level of observability within your application, right? So to kind of tie it all together, 
Um, if you haven't started yet, get some observability, uh, and dynamic observability components within your environment just to make uh, understanding what's going on really as, as easy and uh, seamless as possible. If you have any additional questions for me, uh, please, please feel free to ask. Also happy to interact with you uh, offline over Twitter or uh, email as well. Thank you.